Hi, my name is Marek Vyshinsky and in this presentation we'll talk about one of the approaches to treatment of back pain and sciatica based on the Feldenkrais method. Let's begin with a quote of Kurt Levine, one of the pioneers of modern psychology, person worth researching deeper especially for us Feldenkrais practitioners, for his uh, Levine equation, but that's for another time. We will put some theory behind one of the basic Feldenkrais approaches, one of the techniques that most practitioners learn early in the training programs. The approach was described in the book by Johann Riverand, one of the uh, senior Feldenkrais trainers book called Teaching by Handling. So in the book Johannan describes different levels of control of our nervous system. Low level of control represents subconscious reflexive activity and the higher level of controls represent actions with awareness. So how does it relate to low back pain and sciatica. We need to understand the concept of vicious cycle. Whenever there is pain, and not only sciatica and low back pain, but any kind of pain, there is a normal response of our system uh, producing tension or spasm. Tension is defined as the contraction of muscle or a muscle group beyond its postural or functional need. Muscle spasm is a painful contraction of striated muscle caused by chronic or acute trauma, excessive muscle tension, or organic disorders. An example of a spasm is a cramp. With vicious cycle, we have more pain that increases tension and possibly spasm. Tension and spasm, in return, are sources of pain. So they feed back into the original pain increasing the pain and discomfort. And then there is a more pain, that there is more tension and spasm, and that cycle can circle, feed on itself, and accelerate. So spasm can represent the lowest level of control of the nervous system, where we practically have no volitional control over the muscles. Muscles seize, we cannot stop that. In the case of tension, however, even though it's still rather low level of control of the nervous system, when we become aware of contractions of the muscles, of a particular group of muscles, we can let them go. For example, if you hold your breath and become aware that you're holding your breath, you can restore your normal breathing. That holding, you can let go. If your shoulders are held high up and somebody points it out to you, you can drop your shoulders down. That means you do have volitional control, but that requires awareness. And that's where the Feldenkrais method plays a role. During the lesson, our goal is to help clients become more aware of places where they could decrease their effort let go of unnecessary contractions, become more aware and more knowledgeable about their own body, how they hold themselves, what serves them well, and what might be just a result of the vicious cycle of pain, uh, certain substitutions that occur during the time of recovery, compensations, that new awareness can lead to formation of new patterns, better patterns of posture, movement, holding themselves, and therefore breaking the vicious cycle of pain. The first step in the functional integration is to support. And that supporting of the system of the person can happen in a few ways. One is by taking over the work of muscles. So, in other words, substituting for muscle contraction. So the muscle, let's say, back extensors or flexors, co-contraction of flexors and extensors of the trunk. So we can, with our hands, through soft tissue work, 
begin to very gently shorten the fibers of muscles. For that, of course, we need to know the alignment of fibers of particular muscles that are either in spasm or in excessive tension. We can also use skeletal approach by knowing where particular muscle is originating and inserting which bones. By moving the two bones toward each other, we produce a slack and therefore diminish the contraction. This is an example of substituting for muscle contraction. We can also talk about physical skeletal support. In here we examine how the person is aligned, how the skeleton is doing the job of canceling gravity, or whether the person unknowingly, subconsciously, still contracts the mus certain muscles in order to maintain the position. And the first step, that supporting, may take substantial part of the lesson, if not entire first lesson. The next step will be to introduce, with extreme gentleness, small movements. And typically, we try to avoid bilateral flexion and extension at the get-go, meaning both sides of the spine bending forward or bending backward. But we may start from unilateral flexions or extensions. And we need to watch for any signs of protective responses that could be in terms of person holding breath or suddenly bracing or change of underneath your hands uh, of the state of the tissues or the client the student may report feeling increase of pain and of course anytime we detect these protective responses we want to change our approach so the system is yielding and releasing and feeling safer rather than bracing itself for potential damage. Here's an example of a structure of the functional integration lesson when your student chooses more comfortable side to lie on. In our case it will be the left side as demonstrated on the skeleton here. First we start with a support and taking over and then the way to introduce gentle movements could be to begin by moving the top pelvis forward, very gentle rotation with a hint of flexion where with the rotation we're starting to separate the distance between the pelvis and the ribs. Then we can constrain with our one hand the rib cage, the lower rib cage, and continue with the gentle rotation of the pelvis. After a few movements we return and we see if there is an improvement in the original state. Then we do the similar strategy with the shoulder and the rib cage. In this technique my left hand applies pressure through the right shoulder blade engaging rib cage in a gentle amount of rotation. Rotation to the left or moving the right ribs forward. As you see the lower ribs move a little bit away from the pelvis. It's a very small amount of movement still it's a movement of separating the lower ribs from the pelvis. Here I place my right hand on the lower ribs and my left hand continues to do the movement as previously. My right hand is restricting movement of the lower ribs. For a person with lower back pain, this fixation of the lower ribs and not moving them away from the pelvis can feel very reassuring while we work on improving the mobility, the movement of the middle and upper thorax, thoracic spine, rib cage. We go back as always to the original movement to see if there is an improvement.
And here I will constrain the pelvis, restrict the movement of the pelvis while continuing to push forward. Again, watch how the lower ribs move away from the pelvic crest. Now this can be considered unilateral flexion on the right side. Here, my right hand is on the front of the pelvis and left hand as before in the rib cage. I'm pushing the rib cage forward and now I'm pulling with my right hand back. So it's going to and from. The left hand pushes the pelvis, evoking turning. I'm allowing the pelvis to move and now moving the pelvis back. So leading with the ribs, leading with the pelvis on coming back, pushing on the shoulder and then pulling on the pelvis back. This kind of seesaw movement, initiating forward movement with the chest and backward movement with the pelvis. And now going in opposite directions. Pelvis is moving backward while the shoulder and ribs move forward. How this gentle twist increases length of the lower back of the lumbar spine. When done properly, the lower ribs of the person will start to become more active, more supple in breathing. After properly executed technique like that, you may see breathing movements in this area. Lower back, when contracted, when in spasm, grabs the lower ribs and splints it to the pelvis as we release the tension and spasm, you will observe more freedom of the ribs for breathing. In this technique, you sit in front of the person and you take the lower leg, case here, right lower leg above the ankle and the right knee rests on the other knee. We put the right hand on the front side of the pelvis where muscles like tensor fascia lata, that evoke internal rotation, all portions of the gluteus medius muscle that connect the pelvis with a, a greater trochanter and evoke internal rotation. So we can feel while we are performing this technique, we can feel the state of tension What's worth understanding is that the leg, the weight of the leg can start to pull the pelvis and therefore evoke tension and splinting of the lower back that will fixate the pelvis. So feel tensor fascia lata and gluteus medius may pull the pelvis while the leg is lifting, pull the pelvis down. So therefore the lower back, it's logical that it will be contracting to hold the pelvis and therefore excessive tension of the internal rotators of the hip can be the reason why, why the lower back is so contracted. So here we're lifting and we can lift the lower leg and observe what happens in the lower back. Can we restore freedom both in the hip joint, internal rotation, gluteus medius, and the freedom in the lower back. So here are fragments of what this lesson could look like with a real person. I pay attention to the lower back on the right side as I press through her right shoulder blade and turn the chest. Then I will restrict the lower ribs on her right side and continue to move the shoulder and the upper rib cage into rotation. Now 
And the same technique with student's upper arm, right arm in front, restricting the right ribs while mobilizing the thorax into rotation and gentle flexion. You see, I'm adjusting how much of rotation and how much flexion I'm intending to evoke, depending on what I find is available, what is the easiest pattern of movement. I return to the hip. Which isn't moving much yet. And I need to be disciplined, not to try. My right hand will fix the pelvis, the greater trochanter, the right hip, while I continue to apply pressure with my left hand into the shoulder blade, into the ribs, encouraging the right rib cage to rotate and to flex observing the lower back the response of the muscles and the length of the lower back here i'm fixing the pelvis not through greater trochanter but on the ilium near the anterior superior iliac spine and the pelvic crest replicating the same idea the same movement moving only within the range that i find is possible and easy not evoking any protective responses from the student i watch for the smallest signs of improvement breathing how those lower ribs around this area here how they participate with inhalation and exhalation i place the right hand on the pelvis and the left hand on the hand of the right ribs and i push with my left hand and pull with the right hand to return left hand initiate rolling forward right hand initiates coming back only within the range that's easy i change the angle of the pull on the pelvis searching whether it will make an improvement in movement again this process is of searching not imposing but looking for subtle differences in the direction that will make the movement a little easier and with this changed angle it appears like I have a little bit easier movement here she's allowing me to roll forward and back and watch the improvement after a few minutes of functional integration the pelvis is freer to move lower back can lengthen and i can perform a gentle oscillation but i need to be disciplined not to try to oscillate or rock or jostle but only work within the range that's comfortable for the client
My right hand is on the lower rib cage and the left hand on the middle upper rib cage. I'm evoking rotation and flexion with my left hand. And now following at the end of movement with my right hand forward. And now I'm starting to pull back with my right hand. So the left hand guides forward movement and the right hand is pulling back. Go back to the original movement to see how much improvement each approximation offers. And now I push on the pelvis and the shoulder and upper rib cage, evoking flexion, lengthening of the right side of the back. Push from the left hand into flexion and then right hand into flexion, alternating. Once from the right hand, once for the left hand. Mm -hmm. And back to supporting shortening of the back extensors. I am lifting with my left hand just above the ankle, evoking internal rotation of the, her right hip. Lifting the right leg and internally rotating the right hip. We can palpate with our right hand the state of musculature around the right hip, whether there is excessive tension. In some cases, you will feel bulging or contracting of the muscles of the tensor fascia lata and gluteus medius muscles. In extreme cases, you will see our clients helping, our students helping us to the point that you could remove your left hand and the student will keep the leg lifted. This represents lower level of control of the nervous system, a subconscious activity, which results in contraction of the right hip muscles. This is an opportunity for student to become aware of the tension and letting go. I can ask the student to place her hand on her hip and lift her leg and have her hold the leg up in the air and sense the tension, the contraction that's necessary for holding the leg up in the, up in the air. And then what it means to let go. You see, when the student holds the leg up in the air, that weight of the leg is pulling on the pelvis downward, so the lower back muscles have to contract to hold the pelvis and ribs in the same distance. Tension in the hip muscles is therefore associated with the tension of the back muscles. Bringing that feeling to consciousness of the student may be quite important discovery how to let go of excessive tension and spasm in the lower back. If you're interested in studying a little bit more I would like to invite you to the three-day intensive continuing education course on December 13 to 15, where strategies, Feldenkrais strategies for treating lower back pain and sciatica will be discussed. I hope to see you there. Thank you.